Thank you, Carolyn. In the summer of 2009, uh, I got a phone call from my mother, and it seems that my father was in pretty serious condition in the hospital. And so uh, I made one of those quick trips to the Dallas area and, and uh, packed several changes of clothes because I didn't know how long I'd be there. When I got there, he was indeed in quite serious condition. He had been uh, battling with lung cancer for some time. And uh, <clears throat> I'm going to struggle with this. Y'all just bear with me. I got to spend some really sweet time with my father. Uh, uh, all day, I'd, I'd feed him, I'd shave him, um, and even though he was on oxygen, he was very talkative, um, which is kind of strange for my dad because he's not a very talkative person. Uh, but one night, I came home to the home, uh, their home, and, and to which I came when I was born. I mean, they came home from the hospital to that house in Dallas, and uh, staying there overnight so I could get some rest before going to the hospital the next day. And I wrote an email to my two sons. This is what I said. I'm staying at their house. And as I tried to get to sleep last night, it occurred to me that my dad would never sleep there again. I cried myself to sleep. It's been great to get to sit by his bed and visit, though. Like we so often do with those we love, I've taken him for granted at times. This small, unassuming man is a real hero in every sense of the word. He flew 32 bombing missions over Germany. The casualty rate for those crews was one of the highest in the entire war, and most of his missions involved nursing a bullet-ridden, crippled B-24 back to the base in Italy. On one mission, he was wounded and was the only member of a 10-man crew to survive. He burned up two 50 caliber Browning machine guns firing at attacking Messerschmitt ME-109s. And when the dirty work of protecting this country's freedom was done, he came home and built a life. Married, raised a family, and provided a loving, caring environment for all of us. He is indeed part of the greatest generation. We talk a lot about his dying. It's not comfortable for me, but it's necessary for him. He does not fear it because his faith in Christ has provided him security and peace of mind. But he's concerned that mom will be cared for, and he's almost obsessive about making arrangements. We've put together his funeral, but my prayer is that it will be further in the future than he expects. My dad died the next day. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4, if you will. When I sent my email out to you, uh, you might have noted a word that I used to describe not only 2 Timothy, but particularly chapter 4, poignant. And as I listened to what Timothy says to his young son in the faith, I'm, I'm sorry, that Paul says to his young son in the faith, Timothy, uh, I think he's pouring his heart out because he knows he's going to die, and he knows he's going to die soon. And you stop and think, what are things that I would like to say if I knew I wouldn't be around very long? And that's what you get here. And I hope that you look at it through that prism. I really do, because it's Scripture, it's of the Holy Spirit, it's inspired, uh, but it's also personal. And it's Paul who's writing a truth to a young friend that's timeless, and it's for us too. So look at it on two levels, if you will. Don't miss the poignancy of Paul, uh, you know, just pouring out his love to his young friend but also to him pouring out his love to the church and to us by extension. In the presence of God in Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. So before we read the charge, I want you to see how he set this up. 
He's saying, I know that I'm in view of the Almighty. I know that God is watching me and leading me as I write this. And, you know, you've heard somebody say, I swear on the stack of Bibles. That's nothing compared to this. He says, let me tell you, God's watching what I write. So listen to what I'm putting down here. I charge you this, preach the word. He could have just stopped there. What did he tell them to preach? Is it capitalized in your, in your book? Okay, so that's got two meanings. Number one, he's talking about the Word of God. He's talking about Scripture. But also, remember, John 1, 1. In the beginning was... So in a very real essence, since it's capitalized here, I believe he's also saying preach Christ. Because what has Paul said in other places? You know what? We preach Christ and Him crucified. That's the gospel. You don't have to pretty it up. It doesn't need any help. So when he, it's just kind of interesting. Some of the last things he's, he believes he's going to say to his young friend, he says, preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Let me stop right there. I used to teach a little seminar class for Bible study teachers. Uh, and I talked about the, the P's. Uh, you know, you're talking about prayer. I say, you got three P's if you're going to be a Sunday school teacher. You better have all three of them. Prayer, preparation, and passion. You better have a passion for sharing God's Word. And you really need to pray that God will, will reveal to you His truth. But let me tell you what, there's no substitute for preparation either. And a, and a Bible study teacher who gets up and wings it, I'm telling you, is betraying a trust. So he's telling him, be ready. In season and out of season. In other words, in the pulpit, or wherever else you, you happen to be, you be ready to preach the word. Correct, rebuke, and encourage. That's kind of interesting, isn't it? In the, in the many roles, the many hats that a pastor's expected to take, and, and Timothy is his young pastor protege. And so he says, look, you may have to correct bad doctrine, you may actually have to rebuke, and you may also encourage, but do so with great patience and careful instruction. Why? Listen, here, here is something that Paul writes about letter after letter, uh, and we've been through them all by now, and I hope you've got the picture. He says, For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. It, it's not new. It was happening in the in first century. It was happening, uh, uh, you know, in the 15th century. It's happening today. Uh, it seems like it's happening more and more often. But what man has done throughout time, and it goes all the way back to the Tower of Babel, is he wants to be God. So if man's going to worship a deity, what we tend to do is invent one, cobble one up, make one up of all the elements we like, and generally it's a God that serves us. It's a God that blesses us. And so look, look what he's saying here. They're, they're not going to listen to sound doctrine. It doesn't tickle their ears. It's hard. Sometimes it's very difficult. And sometimes it doesn't tell us what we want to hear. So what we do, and, and you see it all over the place now, there, there are churches formed to support a belief. Not the gospel, but a belief. And they call themselves the church, and they can worship a God that they created to provide them with the things they need. We do it, and we've done it for centuries. And so he's warning Timothy, he said, look, they're not going to listen to sound doctrine, and instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears wants to hear. I got a really interesting card in the mail this week, and, and I don't know too much about this church. They may be a, a, a really good church. But it was a brightly colored card, and, it's, and it said, Killer music, uh, come casual, and we're talking about sex. I'm thinking, okay. And then it got a little more graphic, actually. And, and I thought, there's a place for that. You know, there's, that's, sex is certainly scriptural. I mean, you know, we can deal with that. But if you're going to attract people to your church... Send out a mailer that says sex in big letters. And I'm thinking, boy, what do our itching ears want to hear anymore? 
And listen, I really ought to go to that church and, and sit down for a session or two. It may be really great. I'm just a little nervous about the way they're trying to attract people. I'm all for the killer music. Okay. But what are people going to do? They're going to say, you know what? I recognize, maybe they're not going to confess a sin, but I recognize that here's some things that I do that probably doesn't square with God's Word. So let me tell you, I'll rewrite God's Word. And I'll gather, I'll find a teacher who will rewrite it for me and who will preach. And so then I'll feel real good because I'm in church and a preacher's saying it and it must be right if the preacher says it. So they'll gather around them a number of teachers. Not hard to do. Then any heresy that's ever come across the line, someone's willing to preach it. They want to hear it, I'll find a teacher. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. In other words, falsehood. The, the, the falsehood of the day is the prosperity gospel. God wants to make you rich. Well, He does. Not in the way they say, but He does. And so there's a myth, because their itching ears want to hear that. And then he, he turns entirely the opposite direction. He says, here's what they want to do. Here's what they're going to do. Here's what you're going to face. But you, so he's talking back to Timothy now, keep your head in all situations. He's talking to me. Because I have a real problem with that. I, have, I, I tend to be very confrontational. Uh, and the more I'm, I do this, the more I realize I need to get off of that. Because when it talks about uh, in First Peter about to always be willing to give a reason, and then it talks later about do so in all gentleness and all respect. And so he's saying, keep your head. You're going to face those troubles, but keep your head. And then he says, endure hardship. Okay, it's a command. You see what he's saying? Endure hardship. Here's what's interesting about that. He didn't say hardship may come, be ready for it. Paul took it as a given. What did Paul endure his, his entire ministry? Hardship. What did he fully expect that Timothy was going to endure his entire ministry? Hardship. So he didn't soft pedal it. He didn't say, hey, be on the lookout for hardship and be ready for it. He's, he, it's just assumed. Hardship's coming. What should I do? Endure it. There's a word that's shot throughout Scripture, and we don't like it one little bit. Stop and think. I'm not a big fan of enduring. Like endure pain, endure hardship. You know, I, I like avoid. I like that. But here's what's kind of interesting. The whole idea, particularly you get it in the letters to the, to the churches at the, end, at, at the beginning of Revelation, and they keep talking about persevere, persevere. He, he who endures till the end. And that indicates that it's not going to be easy. But our lot is to endure. Have you ever stopped to think that we are actually asked to be punching bags? Ooh, that makes me uncomfortable. And I can tell from the looks on your faces, you aren't too thrilled about it either. But we sure are. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. This is kind of interesting. Um, you can look at that a couple of ways. Is he talking to Timothy? Or is he talking to all of us? I'm kind of thinking he's talking to all of us, but even if you say, well, he's talking to those preachers, you go, Jack, you know. Um, but stop and think how many preachers aren't evangelists. I've been, at, I've been at churches where I don't know that I ever heard the pastor say one time uh, about, about talking to a person about salvation or leading a person to the Lord or leading his church to lead people to the Lord. You don't have that problem here, by the way. But isn't that amazing? Because his charge is, and I don't think anybody believes his charge is just to Timothy, but certainly to Timothy and certain to, certainly to pastors. And I think if you're a priest, which you are, do the work of, a, of an evangelist. Discharge all the duties of your ministry. Our uh, staff meetings are kind of interesting um, because Dan regularly, uh, he, he begins the staff meeting with a little devotional with prayer. And then he talks to us about doing your work. You know, if you've got an 80-hour week in front of you, you've got an 80-hour week. That's what you do. It's, it's your ministry. Do your work. Don't be found lacking in doing the work of your ministry. 
uh, stay above reproach. And I mean, he's constantly with us, encouraging us about those things, discharge the duties of your ministry. And that's what Paul is doing with his young protege. Then he says something very interesting. And it's almost like with that, he's, he's completed his, his charge to Timothy. Discharge the duties. Why? Because I'm being poured out. I, I don't know if you've read... Uh, particularly in Leviticus, the, the descriptions, the different types of offerings, you know, grain offering, a wave offering, which is really interesting. You ought to read about the wave offering. But a drink offering is typically uh, when, when wine is, or oil sometimes, but generally wine, is pulled, poured around the altar uh, to make a pleasing fragrance uh, of, of the offering that's being made to God. And so look at the way he describes the end of his life. He says, I'm being poured out, and you get the picture of the dregs, the last of that, of that flagon of, of wine that's being poured out. He says, I'm being poured out like a drink offering. You know what that means? His blood. I'm running out. I'm running out. And the time has come for my departure. So he says, look, it's a done deal. This time, I, let me tell you, there have been several times in his life Paul thought he was a goner, particularly when he was left, left for dead outside of uh, Lystra. You know? uh, but in this particular time, he says, you know what, the time's come. I don't, can't name the hour, but I know I'm done. I have fought the good fight. I finished the race. And remember, I've talked to you several times when Paul is talking about perseverance, where he gives the picture in, uh, in sports metaphor of a runner breaking the tape. And remember, I've showed you, anybody, here, anybody else here has ever run track? When you break through the finish line, what do you do? You've seen him lean. That's what he's saying. I have burst through the tape. I'm there. And I didn't pull up lame at the end. I have kept the faith. And look now, as he, as he makes that statement, he looks forward to the future. He says, now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness. And crown is not what we think of as crown. It's not a round, bejeweled gold ring. But crown, in this case, is what he's talking about is the victory wreath that is given to Olympic champions. So he's given the picture of a race. He says, okay, I burst through the finish line. I finished the race. Now I'm going to get my reward. I'm going to get the crown of righteousness. Now listen to how he describes it. Which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. What's that day? Day of judgment. When he says, good, well done, good and faithful servant, I'm going to receive the victor's crown for, for running the race. And not only to me, but to whom else? To all those who have longed for his appearing. And remember in the letter to Titus, he talked about the blessed hope the glorious appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. And, and Paul is saying to Timothy, that's what I'm in it for. That's why I'm here. That's why I still live when I just as soon die, it'd be easier to die, a lot more comfortable for me. But I'm still in it for the promise, the hope of the glorious appearing of my Lord Jesus Christ. I read this a lot at graveside services. I can think of no more beautiful tribute for one who loves the Lord than as we're there at the graveside to say, you know what? I've run the race. There's a crown of righteousness awaiting me. And then it's almost like he said what he has to say, and he says, well, I'm still alive. So here are my little details. And the, the details say a lot about Paul's heart. So listen as we kind of clean up things here at the end. Do your best to come to me quickly. He doesn't think he'll ever see Timothy again, and the history records he probably didn't, that he never saw him again. But he's saying, okay, if you can get here, do. Come to me quickly, because he knows he's about to die. For Demas, because he loved this world, has deserted me and has gone to Thessalonica. Demas was a yoke fellow, was, was part, an integral part of the ministry, and these are about as sad a words as you can find in Scripture. Demas left him. Demas abandoned the ministry. Why? Very simple. He loved the world. Yeah. He, he, said, he looked at what, what, what the Lord had to offer, and he looked at what the world had to offer, and he made the choice. 
and he left. Crescens has gone to Galatia. We, we don't hear anything else about Crescens anywhere else in Scripture, but we do know that he was a part of the ministry. Now, Demas abandoned him. Crescens didn't. Crescens is on duty. He's been sent off uh, on assignment. So Crescens has gone to Thessalonica. Titus, we know Titus, you know, was still uh, still as faithful and, and true work servant. Uh, he's gone to he's gone to Dalmatia. Uh, only Luke is with me. That's kind of interesting because when we first started this journey, we did so with a study of Acts penned under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit by Luke. And remember, in this, as we read through Acts, as we studied it, uh, there were the we, the we sections and the they sections. So we know that Luke was with him intermittently throughout his missionary journeys. But right now, Luke is in Rome with him. Get Mark. What's remarkable about that? What's remarkable? Anything sound strange about that? Did anybody read that and say, whoa? Mark deserted him. Remember when they, on their first, after their first missionary journey uh, with Barnabas, uh, Mark's cousin, and, and uh, they, Mark was along with them, and we don't, under, we don't really know to this day the, the nature of their falling out, whether Mark just didn't want to make another trip, what happened, but we, don't, we do know that Paul was pretty unhappy with Mark. And, and Barnabas says, well, okay, if Mark's not going to go, Barnabas said, okay, trying to soothe things over, said, uh, I believe I'll go ahead and stay here with Mark. I'm sorry. Then Silas picked up uh, where Barnabas left off. And so there was a rift. We do know that Mark was useful. John Mark was useful to his ministry, but we do know that he and Paul at one time had such a falling out that they weren't talking to one another. And look what happens at the end of his life. Get Mark. Bring him with you. Because he is helpful to me in my ministry. Now, it's kind of instructive to me that the word that's translated ministry is not a word that's usually translated ministry. It's diakonia, which is the same word that we get deacon from, for example. So a better word would have been because he is useful to me in my service. We don't know why he chose that word, but you get, you get uh, from that picture that Mark was probably once again uh, yoked together with him in the ministry. But it's really neat that he said it near the end of his life. We patch things up. Get Mark. All right. I sent Tychicus or Tychicus to Ephesus. Tychicus is the, is the Greek pronunciation. I sent him to Ephesus. When you come, this is kind of interesting because there's still the ever practical Paul. Uh, he is in all likelihood now not under house arrest, but in a in a cold, dank, dark prison. And so when he's talking to Timothy about coming, he said, come on, if you will. And by the way, can you bring a coat? And that's what he's asking here. When you come, bring the cloak I left with Carpus at Troas. And what else does he ask for? My scrolls, particularly the parchments, likely those would have been not any of the letters that he'd written before, but what we would call the New Testament today uh, would be the scrolls that he kept that had his scripture on it. Then a very interesting aside. We don't know why in the world Paul would jump from what he's done so far, but I think he wants Timothy to know this. He said, Alexander, and I've in your margins, in your, in your notes, you may have this may be the Alexander of this passage or that passage. We don't know. They, listen, Alexander was like the name John is today. You know, we have no idea. There, there are thousands of Alexanders, so we don't know who it was. But Alexander, the metal worker, did me a great deal of harm. We don't know what the harm was. We don't know who Alexander was. But apparently Paul still had a burr under his saddle about it. He was not too happy about it. And he wanted to make sure Timothy knew it. He did me a great deal of harm. And I love what he said. He did, did he say, you get him for me? Not what he said. He said, the Lord will repay him for what he's done. And you know what? If Alexander, the metal worker, came back to the Lord in repentance, I'm sure that Paul would be the first person to welcome him back. But right now, he said, I can't deal with him. You don't deal with him, but the Lord will deal with him. You too should be on your guard against him because he strongly opposed our message. So we don't know if he was one of the false teachers, uh, what role he played in opposing the gospel message, but we do know that Paul warned Timothy about him. At my first defense, no one came to my support, but everyone deserted me. There's a temptation to think that he's talking about his first imprisonment 
in Rome, that's, that's not what he's talking about. I think this is the current imprisonment, and le let me just substitute arraignment, okay? At my arraignment, when I was first brought in and charges were read against me because he was, after all, a Roman citizen, no one came to my support, but everyone deserted me. Well, who is everyone? Don't know, but he had a number of people who were in the ministry with him. Uh, we do know that Demas was one of them. And could be even some of the Romans whom he had converted while he was under arrest. But no one stood up for him. And I think of Christ on the cross saying, Lord, for God forgive, for, forgive them for they know not what they do. When Paul says, may it not be held against them. Because I believe, as it was in Jesus' case, that, that coming overtly to his support would have not been healthy for them. And he said, I understand that. He's still hurt, you can tell. But he says, look, I don't blame them for doing it. But the Lord stood at my side. Everybody else deserted me, but who stayed with me? The Lord did. He gave me strength so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. You know, we've, we've heard that so much and we've read it so much that I don't know that we've really stopped to think what a remarkable statement he just made. Because if we look back at Paul's long journey, look back early in Acts when we first read about a young man named Saul, what's the first mention that we had of Saul in Scripture? You remember? At the, at the stoning of Stephen, stop and think, at the stoning of Stephen, when they stoned him to death, they put their cloaks at the feet of, of a young man named Saul. And he said later that he assented to it. We don't know that he took part in it, but he agreed in it. And then he took off to aggressively pursue and arrest and persecute non-believers. I'm sorry, believers because he was a non-believer. So look what he says there. Then when God first came to him and put scales over his eyes and struck him blind, he said, okay, Mr. Jew, Mr. Pharisee, uh, Mr. Studied at the feet of Gamaliel, Mr. Most Jewish of all the Jews, I want you to take the word to... Oh, how that... Talk about delicious irony. Delicious irony. He says, guess what? I'm calling you into my service. You're going to be a, a missionary. And guess where you're going? To the Gentiles. And I, I imagine every time Paul said that, he giggled just a little bit. He said, I cannot imagine. Still, remember, at every stop, where did he stop first? Stopped at the, at the synagogue, uh, at, the, at the house meetings of, of, the, of the Jews, wherever he could. But he, his, his focus and his ministry was to take the word to the Gentiles, and that's what he said. Through me the message might be proclaimed, and all the Gentiles might hear it. And I was delivered from the lion's mouth. Uh, I don't know if he's talking about in his first imprisonment when he was released and got a chance to go on his fourth missionary journey, or if he's talking about just he made it through the arraignment, but he doesn't indicate that he's talking about physical safety here. just means that God had protected him so that he could continue to teach, the, to bring his message. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and will bring me safely to Spain. It's kind of interesting. When you, when he starts saying the Lord will rescue me, you're thinking, okay, well, he's going to save him from execution. Paul never assumed that. He's going to preserve him until that time that he's taken to be with the Lord. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now he's going to give his final greetings. And I think this is kind of interesting because when he says, greet Priscilla, that's not what he says in the Greek at all. He says, greet, greet Prisca, P-R-I-S-C-A. Some of you, I don't know if the, the old King James still has that, but uh, it is the diminutive of Priscilla, which is the endearing one. Uh, it's little, little Priscilla, or, or it's a very personal greeting. So when he says, greet Prisca or greet Priscilla, it is a very personal greeting, not just say hi to your folks. It's Greek Prisca and Aquila, and the household of Anisiphorus. Erastus stayed in Corinth, and I left Trophimus sick in Miletus. So what he's doing, he's kind of calling the role of the, the members of the ministry for Timothy. He's saying, look, here's where your support is. 
per particularly, I love the, his, his fondness for Priscilla and Aquila, who were real stalwarts uh, in, the early, in the early movement. Do your best to get here before winter. Uh, one of my very favorite sermons that Dan has shared over the years, and he's done it twice in 12 years, which is kind of unusual for Dan, um, but it, it's called Come Before Winter. When he talks about, about Paul as his life's ebbing away, really desires to see Timothy. And in winter, it was not safe to sail in the Mediterranean after October, as a matter of fact. So we know he was writing this probably in the summertime because he's saying, look, you need to get here as soon as you can because it's not safe to sail. Do your best to get here before winter. Eubulus greets you, and so do Pudens, which is a, 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 Roman, a Roman name, Latin name, by the way, Linus, Claudia, and all the brothers. We don't know to whom he's referring. Uh, when he says all the other, others have left me, we're assuming it's those who were initially in his, uh, in his ministry, and that these that he talks about being with him now are, are converts likely in Rome, or members of the church at Rome. So that's why he's saying everyone's left me, but these people send their greetings. Now this is kind of interesting. He says, the Lord be with your spirit. In the Greek, that's singular. So he's talking to Timothy. The Lord be with your spirit. Grace be with you is plural. So that's where we get the evidence that this was likely meant to be read to a wider audience. Probably at Ephesus. So when Paul's writing, it's a very personal letter to Timothy, but when he says, grace be with y'all, is what he's saying. It's a plural. So with that, Paul closes not only the, the last chapter in 2 Timothy, but the last chapter in his life. And I think if you want, to, you want to see the heart of a man, I know that as I sat with my father, I realized what he was doing was trying to say all those things he never said to me. Had the greatest dad in the world, but he never told me he loved me until right before he died. I think he didn't know how. His folks never told him that. I knew he did. I knew he did. But, you know, he said, I love you, son. And I thought, whoa. Didn't realize how odd that sounded coming from him. But he said all the things he really wanted to say, knowing that he was going to go be with the Lord. And here's Paul. And what's he telling his young charge? Distill down the important things. Preach the word. Watch out for false teachers. And by the way, watch out for Alexander. You know? Stay the course. Be ready for, for trials and tribulations. So it's almost like in a, in a rush of words, he's closing the chapter uh, on the last chapter of his life. As I've told you before, we're, we're done with this series, and it was a year and a half, I guess, we've been in this series. Uh, we're going to move to the Psalms, but I've got a very brief series of messages that uh, Dan has asked all the Bible study teachers to share. And they're just some very important principles about how you deal with stuff. Uh, and that's as part of our ongoing emphasis on breaking free. But uh, whether you are in financial peace or not makes no difference. These are five timeless principles from Scripture about how we're really supposed to deal with stuff. You've heard it preached, but I'd look it up yourself. Jesus said more about dealing with your possessions than he did about prayer or salvation, which speaks to our heart, I think. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much that you have preserved this scripture inspired by the Holy Spirit, penned by the Apostle, and that as we close today, Father, we see such an outpouring of Paul's heart. Father, oh, that, that we would have the same heart. That such a love for you, Father, that we are willing to endure to the very end. And I thank you for this class who have endured to the very end of this series. And I thank you for their, their, their love for the scripture and their willingness to come share it and, and watch it flower in their lives. And Father, as we begin our, our next series, as we look at your psalms, the hymns of praise to you, I want to ask, Father, that you illuminate it also, and that as we go our way today, that, uh, Father, that everywhere we go, we are indeed people sharing Jesus. For I ask it in the name of your Son. Amen. Please find someone you don't know and say hello to them.